the daughters demand the land, a female uprising in ancient Israel, and God says the ladies are right. She was somebody's wife. And laws and letters. It's all coming your way. It's time to start the Quick Study television program. Stay there as we continue. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And I'm Corey. Hey, welcome to the Quick Study Television program, where we take you through the Bible in one year. Now, some people might ask the question, why would you do that? Because the Bible is all about human nature, God's nature, and what that means. Much of what we learn from our history in the Bible helps us to deal with our present, because God is past, present, and future. Now today we're going to be focusing on a very interesting passage of scripture. It is Numbers chapter 26 and 27. A lot of people, you know, say that the Bible is chauvinistic. Well, we'll talk about that and more. Uh, also, the daughters come and ask for land. And complaining in ancient Israel gets them in a whole lot of trouble. Corey, we got Bible Archaeology 2 coming up. We What's do. That? Well, we're taking a look at some of some laws that are outside of God's laws. They're cultural laws. Uh, and we, we look at how God is setting himself up as Israel's king. Really? Yes. So God is doing some programming in their mind uh, around the culture of the day. Very interesting. We have the Bible Challenge coming up as well. Corey, gonna, you're going to answer this. I've, I've assigned okay. this to you. Uh, so here's the Bible <laughs> Challenge. Can you answer it? Who was the wife of Amram? Was that Hogla, Miriam, or Jochebed? All right, this is a great question. Great question, not easily found, but if you read our reading today, it'll be there. And you stay there because we're gonna go on with Truth Text and Corey with Archaeology 101. In 1870, English Bible scholars had a better grip on ancient Hebrew and Greek, with many archaeological discoveries coming to the surface. So a group of scholars decided to revise the authorized version known as the King James Version with this better understanding of the original languages and the newfound ancient manuscripts from archaeology. They completed their work several years later and created what is now called the Revised Version of the English Bible. Numbers, we get some really interesting laws and regulations that God gives to Moses to give to the people for them to live by. Now, some of these are intriguing. Uh, for example, the laws of inheritance when the daughters of a man named Zelophehad are entitled to inherit his property after he passes on, even though they are not men. Now, when we go back into the ancient world, we see examples of other law systems that literally have been there since the beginning of civilization, the, the beginning of the, the cities being built of mankind. We've always realized that we're rebellious by nature. We need laws to help us function in a society. So take a look at this particular set of laws. During Mesopotamia's long history of power struggles, the city of Ashnuna rose up in dominance for a short period of time. This city has yielded to us today its ancient law code. The law code of Ashnuna is the oldest example of Akkadian law we have found so far. It deals with a wide variety of issues, from marriage to produce, from slaves to crime. You may be familiar with the Law Code of Hammurabi. This, too, is a code that outlines the laws of a people. 
but it preserves the laws of a king who overtook Ashnunas' power, a later code. What we are seeing in many ancient cultures are detailed systems to regulate day-to-day -day life. We see complex societies, a thought-out order to lend stability. I'm always fascinated when I take a look at the structure of uh, this, this wilderness wandering, where God appears to be, in, in the ancient context, he appears to be setting himself up as Israel's king. See, a king would give laws. A king would give regulations. And, and we see all throughout example after example of exa after example of God acting like Israel's king. So keep that in mind as you read through the book of Numbers. Closer and closer to the time and the place of Israel fulfilling her covenant, Numbers 26 reports the second census of Israel. Previous to the entrance of the Promised Land, the census takes place. Now her time in the wilderness, it has not been well spent. There's absolutely no growth to the nation. So Numbers 27 reports that the next leader of Israel is Joshua. Moses then is told when and where he will die. God will take him from this life without seeing the land of promise. Numbers 27, verses 1 through 11. Then came the daughters of Zelephahad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh, from the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these were the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirsa. And they stood before Moses, before Eleazar the priest, and before the leaders and all the congregation by the doorway of the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, but he was not in the company of those who gathered together against the Lord in company with Korah, but he died in his own sin, and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be removed from among his family because he had no son? Give us a possession among our father's brothers. So Moses brought their case before the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelephahad speak what is right. You shall surely give them a possession of inheritance among their father's brothers, and cause the inheritance of their father to pass to them. And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a man dies and has no son, then you shall cause his inheritance to pass to his daughter. If he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to the relative closest to him in his family, and he shall possess it. And it shall be to the children of Israel a statute of judgment, just as the Lord commanded Moses. Numbers chapter 27, verses 1 through 11. We study Numbers chapter 26 to 27 with an emphasis on chapter 27. Although we have no idea what the circumstances were surrounding the daughters of Zelophehad, other than the fact that they had no brothers, we do know that they felt the courage. Now listen to this, the courage to ask of God for their rightful inheritance. Now let's explore that. This courage was unusual and this courage was rewarded by God. To ask of God, you know, sometimes takes courage because oftentimes we feel that we don't deserve anything from God. But the truth is if our hearts are right and our minds are in the right place, not clutters with the, with the lust of things and possessions in this world, then God always gives to those he loves and who love him. The truth is God is a giving God. 
In fact, there are times in my life, beloved, when I'm not even asking for something, but there's this deep desire in my heart that I've had for a long time, and God gives it to me. I'm not even talking about necessarily things. I'm talking about people coming to know Christ or whatever, and, and I've forgotten about it, and all of a sudden it happens, and I remember, wow, God, you really did that. And it brings such joy to my heart. There are other times when there's something that I've always wanted to do or, and never been able to do, but I never asked God for it. But one day it happens, and he just decides to give it to me. See, God is a giving God. See, our job is to focus on what he wants. And when we focus on what he wants, then he gets into our business. We get into his business, he gets into our business. That's the principle of the scripture. Now, these daughters, you see, they understood that they, they had an inheritance in the promised land according to the promise of Abraham. Now, that's interesting. I want to look now at Numbers 27, verses 2 and 3. Let's look at it. Here's what it says. And so these daughters, they did. They stood before Moses and before Eliezer, the priest, and before the leaders of all the congregation by the doorway of the tabernacle of meeting. That took courage. These are daughters that are coming up. That took courage. And here's what they said. They said, you know, our father died in the wilderness, but he was not of the company of those who gathered together against the Lord with the company of Korah. He was not a rebel, but he died in his own sin, with his own humanity, and he had no sons. Now, I want you to understand what these daughters did that teach us today, and the Bible and the Holy Spirit puts it here. The place to seek provision is not in the structures of man but in the presence of God. You know, I think sometimes we actually believe that our human governments have the ability to answer all of our needs. Nothing could be further from the truth. The only one who has the ability to provide for all of our needs, if we are a believer in Jesus Christ and we believe the Bible and what it says, the only person who can do that is our Lord and our God. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Two reasons why. One, because we want him and he's given himself to us, not possessions that satisfy us. And two, he supplies all our needs. Needs. There's a difference between wants and needs. Very important. So these daughters, they come, you know, they come to the, the presence here at the, the, the tent of meeting and there's all these leaders hanging around. Imagine the courage these women had. Why? Because they knew it was the will of God that they had their inheritance. This was the promise that they knew the word. They knew the promise. That is important. But wait, there's more. 27. Numbers 27, 3 to 7. Here's what it says. Our father died in the wilderness. He was not of the company of those who gathered against the Lord. He was in a, which were, was Korah, but he died in his own sins, and he had no sons. Why, they asked the question, why should the name of our father be removed from among the, his family because he had no sons? Give us a possession among our father's brothers. So Moses, he brought their case before the Lord. That's smart. Moses is a good man. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad speak what is right. You shall surely give them a possession of the inheritance among their fathers, their brothers, and cause the inheritance of their father to pass to them. Now here it is. Listen carefully to number two. Truth to live by. If your heart is right, ask and you will receive. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. Seek, and you will find. The key here is that your heart has to be right. What does the Bible say in Psalms? Delight yourself in the Lord first, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Why? Because when you delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you new desires for your heart. Somehow we got that mixed up somewhere. We've got to move on. Here's the scripture, verse 6 and 7. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad speak what is right to you. Shall, you shall surely give them a possession of inheritance among their fathers, among their brothers, and cause the inheritance of their fathers to pass to them. Now, this brings us to truth to live by number three. You see, in God's kingdoms, the daughters of God have the same inheritance as the sons of God. Hallelujah. So, my good friends, beloved of God, you need not worry about God being chauvinistic. It's certainly not a biblical God you're talking about. That may be the religions of man, that may be the culture of man, but it's certainly not God. Because God created his daughters with just as much purpose as he created his sons and his daughters. 
have the same inheritance as his son. In Numbers chapter 27, the, the last portion of the chapter, we see that Joshua is being set up. Joshua, who's literally been a servant to Moses since he was a very young man. He's followed Moses everywhere. He's been in the presence of God. He's seen all of this. See, he's being prepared to take over for Moses, to take the leadership of, of the people. And Joshua has been there in those moments where it hasn't been a fun thing. It hasn't been a glorious thing to lead these people. It's a servant position, but God has prepared Joshua. Now, God has not only prepared Joshua, but we see in ancient history that God has prepared the promised land, the land of the Canaanites and the Parasites and the Jebusites, all of the ites. He's prepared that land to be taken over by Israel. They've been in the wilderness. They've been frozen, but the rest of the world has not. So what you and I are going to look at right now is some examples of how the land was being prepared. In 1885, a large library of clay cuneiform tablets were unearthed in what turned out to be the House of the Correspondence of Pharaoh, located in Amarna, Egypt. This record office of correspondence still housed letters from various kings, chieftains, and rulers who were under, loyal to, or partners with Egypt. These letters were written during the reign of Pharaoh Akhenaten, who ruled from 1350 to 1334 BC. This is after the Hebrew exodus from Egypt, and it sets up for us the time period of the conquest of Canaan by Joshua and the time of the judges recorded in the Bible. All of the so-called Amarna letters are written in the political language of the day, Akkadian. And the ones from the area of the promised land are of particular interest. They are all asking for Egypt's help against enemies and invaders. Egypt is losing its grip on its far territory, and the land is up for grabs. Over one-third of the Bible is prophecy. The 66 books of the Bible have a perfect record of prophecies fulfilled. But what does the Bible say about the immediate future of the world? And what about the future of Israel? Does the recent rash of birds falling out of the sky, millions of dead fish, and cattle dying have any significance according to the Bible? Join Rod Hembry in his compelling two-set audio CD series called The Coming Storm. This set is a fascinating Bible study on the complexion of the coming one world empire, the rescue of Israel, and the mysterious disappearance of the church, all predicted from the pages of the Holy Scripture. Call or write today for your copy of the Coming Storm Bible Study on Near Future and End of Time with Rod Hembry. When you write or call, please remember that Quick Study is viewer supported, and we need your help to continue teaching through God's Word. Suggested donation is $25, and to receive your copy of The Coming Storm, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, or P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 1566801501. You can also use the Internet, or you can call and talk to someone in the office. Call today, write today, and get your copy of The Coming Storm. Strange. 
strange but true. Places, people, ancient scribes record amazing truth. Ancient scribes record amazing truth. The Bible reports that marriage is God's idea. It is not an institution of man, his culture, or society. In fact, the word husband in the original Hebrew language, pronounced ish, means champion servant, protector, and implies the husband is to serve God by protecting his family from evil. The word husband is masculine in the original language and reserved only for men. It is first used in Genesis 3.6 in which the wife of Adam is left unprotected and alone while Satan tricks her with his words. In the ancient culture of man, women were seen as only a little higher than livestock. Oftentimes, men would have more than one or two wives to service his family. The idea of God's original plan for family was degraded and destroyed by centuries of sin. One man and one woman. Women who were created in the image of God, according to Genesis, were often degraded and made into slaves. But in God's law, the provision and protection for women is clearly visible and turns counterculture to the ways even of this world and even today. I suppose one of the most amazing things I like telling folks who believe that the Bible is chauvinistic, not understanding the context of the culture, not understanding that God uses the culture to speak. He doesn't come in and abruptly rewrite earth every time he, his presence comes in. You know, the, he's going to do that at the millennium, but he doesn't do that now. And in the final new earth and the new heaven is going to happen. God uses the culture. And one of the things he does, and through Paul, the, the, the former Pharisee, I mean, the chauvinist of chauvinist, uh, who people like to, scholars, liberal scholars like to call him a chauvinist, in Galatians, he makes this astounding, stunning statement to the province of Galatia. Here's what he says. There is therefore now no free or slave, no barbarian or Sicilian, but what? No male or female, but all are the sons of God. And so this former Pharisee in the New Testament ascribes the same inheritance to women as he does to the sons of God. This is fascinating. And so anybody who says the Bible is chauvinistic is reading the Bible out of context and hasn't read all of it. Even in the Mosaic Laws you see special provision for women. That's right. And today we see it today with the sons of, how do you say it? The daughters of Zelephahad. Right. I said it prophetically. See the sons of. <laughs> the daughters of Zelepha, Zelephahad. Zelephahad. A name that always trips me up. What is amazing to me, now what do you think Moses thought? Okay, he, they come to Moses and they say, uh, you know, we don't have a son and our father, he wasn't a rebel mm -hmm. like Korah was in the rebellion. Why shouldn't we get the land? Now think about Moses. All right, I'll take it to God. Yeah. So he goes to God and God says, these women are right. <laughs> Moses is like, oh, okay then. Mm -hmm. And he divvies out the land. What an amazing story. It's a great story. And you know, it, show, it really shows Moses' heart. He knew that he didn't know everything. Yeah. And it also shows a respect for women because he didn't snap right back and say, well, I don't think so, but I'll go and talk to God. He, he said... Well, it's quite, possible, it's quite possible that Moses at that point saw God as acting as the father of those women because in the ancient world, women were given rights, but the rights were bestowed by their father. So a father could, in the ancient culture, could give an inheritance yeah. to his daughter, even if she was married, he could put stipulations on the marriage so the daughter would have control of the property, but it had to be bestowed by the father or by the eldest son acting as the father of the father was gone. So it's very possible that Moses uh, stepped back and allowed God to act as their father. This, what you just brought up, is exactly my point, what Paul was trying to say yes. in Galatians. He was trying to say, to the women of God who don't have a husband or don't have a father for whatever reason. God is your husband. Mm -hmm. God is your father. Mm -hmm. That's what he's trying to say. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and he's trying to say the inheritance. And so I want to encourage you, ladies, that yes, you are disciples of Christ. We have different roles. It's true, in marriage we have different roles. Janice's role is different than mine. Uh, authority and influence. But, you know, influence is more powerful than authority. Uh, the church is the bride of Christ, yet we have the influence to pray and ask God to move on our behalf, and he does. He does. So it's very, very interesting. And we could go on all day. Once again, we can't, we don't have the time. We've run out of time. And I'm sure we'll get people agreeing and disagreeing and flying all over the place. Just look at the scripture and try to figure it out yourself. God will speak to you. Let's get to the Bible IQ question. Who was the wife of Amram? Was that Hogla, Miriam, or Jochebed? Who was it, Corey? Jochebed. And who were they? Amram and Jochebed. The, the parents of Moses, I believe. That's there right. you go. Very By good. the way, women, the titles and the names are mentioned in the Bible. Yes, they are. That's just, for ancient literature, Corey, that's amazing. It is. And uh, Deborah, the prophetess mm -hmm. of Israel, mm -hmm. the judge, judge. Uh, Judges 4, yes. unbelievable. This is unbelievable. I get excited about this. It's fascinating. Now, we do want to leave you with a, uh, a passage to read in the scripture. And uh, so the passage is going to be on the screen. Uh, and we'll put it on the screen. Here it is. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelephahad, speak what is right. You shall surely give them a possession of inheritance among their father's brothers, and cause the inheritance of their father to pass to them. We report, you decide. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. There's the Bible, straight up and straight out. Here's Watch and Pray. Let's pray for these folks. I wanted to leave this with you today. I've been married, well, it'll be 30 years coming up now in October. And the truth is that I could have never been able to do that without the help of the living Lord Jesus Christ. See, I'm a, I'm a stubborn guy. And sometimes I can be such a jerk, you know? But God helps me. And with my wife, Janice and myself, she'll be the first to tell you, as I will, at the way we do this and stay together. And by the way, she still likes me. I think that's pretty good. And that's because of Jesus Christ. I want you to know something. He gets all the credit. It was nothing Janice and I did. He kept us together as we surrendered our lives to him. If you're having trouble in your marriage, may I invite you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and to ask him to help. He always responds to a hurtful heart, someone who's desperate for him. Reach out to Jesus Christ today and ask him to move into your marriage. Thank you for joining us today on Quick Study. Would you pray about supporting this ministry? We are supported by viewers just like you. We receive no special grants from any large organizations or any governments to keep this program going. Your support is a vote to keep the Bible front and center in our culture today. And remember, you can give online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com.